an introduction into Alice technology. So this will be the beginning of our fourth production assignment in the class. Um, and we're joined uh, right now by webinar um, by Rene Marcos, who is the founder uh, of Alice. And I was fortunate to be starting my PhD at Stanford when Rene was uh, finishing uh, his work and got to see the theoretical understanding of production behind it. But uh, since then, Rene has gone on to found a very successful startup so far. Um, and uh, has built Alice to be uh, what I think is one of the future, the most future thinking ways of how BIM and production can be combined together with a new kind of mentality towards production management. So with that, um, we are gonna have about 60 minutes of a conceptual overview and the theory behind Alice. We will take our break a little bit later than normal. Then we'll have our 15 minute break uh, and then we'll have about 30 minutes of a live demo on how to get started working with Alice. Uh, at Renee, um, feel free to take it away. And uh, thank you for joining us. Super. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Uh, thanks for inviting me, everybody. Uh, just a quick um, uh, overview. Uh, the class is usually 45 minutes, 15 minute break, and then 45 minutes, right? That's correct. Super. Okay, so I've uh, definitely pushed stronger, like I mentioned, to present more of the theory. And so expect maybe, you know, to do an hour, 10 minutes on the, on the theory, and then we'll follow the, the, the demo. Uh, because you guys are going to do the Leo project hands-on. And so a lot of what I would have normally covered in the demo, you will already do uh, sort of in person, uh, I believe, a few days from now or a week from now. Uh, super. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's kick it off. So uh, what we're going to cover today uh, is uh, this. So we're going to take a look at CPM, which is really, I think, the standard scheduling solution uh, that's used around the world in basically all construction projects. Uh, whether you're using line of balance or classic CPM or any scheduling solution I'm aware of, uh, it always has a critical path method as the fundamental underlying kind of technology. Uh, we'll move to the theoretical limitations of CPM. Uh, we'll then look at the actual complexity of trying to schedule something, what's involved in really trying to figure out how to build something, right? Now that we've kind of introduced really what the problems are, what the challenges are, really kind of taking a look at how we need to sort of think about building things and what current technology can do to help you. Uh, then we switch into the solution. Uh, and what I'll show you guys is kind of the, the theoretical building blocks of how to think about what Alice says, how we built those pieces together and how they kind of work. From there, we look at, okay, now that we have the pieces, how do you parametrize those pieces? Right. And so I'll explain what that means and what does parametric mean, but like, how do you start you know, doing changes, right, that then reflect uh, in your sort of construction conceptual process model, right? Now that we know how to, you know, create changes, add a crane, remove a crane, model a delay uh, over time, whatever it is, and then figure out how to build something with these changes, then we can take a look at metrics. And so how do we measure how good our solutions are? And with that, basically, we have all of the pieces that we, need. you know, we have an understanding of what the problem is, you know, from a practical and a theoretical perspective. We know what we need to solve. We have the conceptual pieces of the solution. We move to parametrizing those pieces. So being, having the ability to change things and you know, having those changes ripple through your system, which really is how I explain parametric to myself. And then we'll measure at how good our solutions are now that we have all these sort of tools. And then you know, the Alice demo with whatever time we have left. Giving you guys a heads up, uh, this is material that we normally cover in about eight hours at Stanford. And so I've cut a lot of stuff out, but it's pretty condensed. And so um, bear with me, I'm gonna try kind of move at a clip. Um, we'll see, hopefully we can get through all of it. But this is about as condensed as I could make it and, and still be comprehensive. So let's kind of jump into the CPM. Uh, a little bit on the history, and I there's two slides on those. Uh, I always kind of feel that we're part of a noble field, and we should sort of take a look at the folks that came before us. Uh, Gantt charts are through to 1911. 
used on the Hoover Dam by uh, Bechtel Corporation. DuPont and the Rand Corporation developed CPM for the Manhattan Polaris projects, kind of a, a crazy thing, but yeah, they developed it for building the nuclear uh, bomb and the nuclear submarines. 61, a gentleman called Fondal writes this non-computer method to using CPM in the construction industry. In the 1970s, 80s, the industry reads this paper, computerizes it, and we've been stuck on it ever since. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is definitely something, you know, I think maybe two generations beyond uh, what, what's available today. Um, so let's take a, a, at a look at a simple, stupid project. You know, this is a, a, a parking lot. This is the first project we sort of ever ran with, with this technology. Uh, <laughs> it's so simple that most people sort of get confused at why we're using it as an example, right? We've got a, a, a parking lot. $12 million, 115 workday target. Um, it has three floors, and we're going to split into three sections, east, center, west. Um, each of those sections has these tasks. So beams, formwork, decks, formwork, deck, steel, pour the concrete, cure the concrete, stress, prepare strip, strip, move the formwork, right? And so, and you see that you repeat these tasks for each of your sections. So your west section has these tasks, then your center section, you know, uh, east, and so on and so forth, right? So you give this to your scheduler, right? And I'm going to have to sort of pull this up, so forgive me. So you give this to your scheduler and you can really use any scheduling tool. They're really all the same, right? And they'll create this, right? Beams for dex form, pour, cure, stress, prepare, uh, remove, remove formwork, move formwork, and so on and so forth. And you can see that that fragment repeats itself, right? Up to now, really simple, right? Nothing going on. And so the last thing we did is we color coded it based on the resource type, the crews that you're using. And so you can see that the beams formwork needs a beams crew, right? The deck formwork needs a decks crew. This is needs a steel crew. All the masonry tasks need a concrete crew, right? And then you go move back to the carpenters over here. And so let's assume that you have one crew of each type available, right? And so you cannot do these three things at the same time, right? So you say, okay, well, in today's scheduling technology, you'll, somebody will come in and say, look, I can't do these at the same time. So what I'll do is I'll kind of draw an arrow between them, right? Well, okay, well, I got a problem over here. So I draw an arrow. Well, now I've got a problem over here, so I'll draw another arrow, right? And so that's basically how you schedule today. And so I've got kind of three questions for you guys. The first question is, well, we drew the arrow from here to here. Why not draw the arrow from center to west? Once again, we drew the arrow from west to center. Why not from center to west? Right? Another question is that, I don't know if you guys noticed, but we just hard-coded the west, center, east sequence. What about east, center, west? Right? maybe east, west, center, and so on and so forth, right? There's, there's six variations to this, right? And the third question is, well, let's say there's a delay or, or the owner calls me and says, hey, I want to speed this project up. Can you add some resources? Can you add a crew? Well, this, let's say you add one of the carpenter crews, right? The orange one. Will this happen automatically? Or will this happen automatically? or I'll turn to do that. Right. You guys kind of get the point here. And so the, the reason that this is happening on a, from a theoretical perspective is that what CPM is forcing you to do is use precedence, 
constraints to resolve resource constraints. Precedence is logic. What has, has to happen for what? These arrows. Resource limitations are, you know, what resources do I have to build to do certain processes, certain tasks, right? And what this tool does really, really well is it resolves re precedence. It does not at all resolve resources. Uh, for those of you that have really delved in depth into CPM scheduling technology, you'll notice that, you know, those tools can um, move tasks around within their float. That's what they can do. Right? So anyways, um, is this clear at this point in time, right? That the tool forces you to sort of draw these arrows, right? And it doesn't dynamically kind of redraw those arrows for you, whether for resequencing or adding resources or modeling delay or whatever it is, right? You can't do that or that automatically or that automatically. I think we're clear. Super. Thanks a lot, Daniel. So, now that we've kind of taken a look at it from a sort of theoretical perspective, and we actually get the students to do this, you know, painfully, right? And so they kind of go in and, and we ask them to schedule it with one crew of each type, two crews of each type, you know, try different sequences, you know, and they, they come back and they sort of go, well, well that was hard, right? Um, we by the way, <laughs> sorry, say that again. First, in our first assignment, we also had them do it manually. So. All right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, lots, lots of fun, right? Um, so the, um, would anybody like to guess how many lines of code it takes to, to, to code CPM to do the forward and backward pass? And the answer is actually 16.16. Just kind of crazy when you think about it, right? You've got 10% of all GDP. I, don't know what the latest number is, but it's going to be around $9 trillion worth of construction is sitting on top of 16 lines of code, right? So now that we have that, um, you know, this is kind of just here in case the, uh, the web portal didn't work. Let's take a look at the th limitations from a theoretical perspective, right? And so, um, The first thing we're going to take a look at is, is search algorithms, right? And so if you were to take a artificial intelligence class uh, anywhere in the world, uh, day one, class one, uh, they teach you this stuff. And this is what they called AI back in, let's say, the 60s or the 70s, right? Things have moved substantially since then. And the first version we had of Alice worked on something similar. What we have today is, you know, maybe 30,000 lines of code more complicated, but it is still a useful concept. And so I always uh, tell my students that uh, I strongly recommend that they take a minor in computer science. Um, I think it's, you know, the world is digitizing and there's, there's nothing anyone can do to change that. So let's take a look at um, basic search algorithms. We have a robot and the robot name is Stanley and Stanley wants to get to his goal state. And poor Stanley doesn't know how to do it. And so in order to solve this problem, we need three things. We need a current state specifier, Stanley is an A1, future state generator, where can Stanley go? Current state equals go state check. Is A1 equal to E5? No. So a, Stanley starts at A1, well, he could move to A2, B2, B1, right? <coughs> if he moved to A2, well, then he could move to A3, B3, B2, B1, A1. If he moved to B2, then he could move to these locations. If he moved to B1, he could move to these locations, right? Well, what you'll notice is that by the time we get to the solution, there's a lot, a lot of these, what they call leaves, right? And so I'm not going to get into all of these, given the time restrictions, but uh, strongly recommend that you guys Google some basic searches. You know, this is called a tree. The last thing, these are called levels. So that's level one, two, three, right? Leaves are the last ones. Each path through that tree is a solution, right? If you look at all possible solutions, it's exhaustive, you know, and then there's lots of different ways. Breadth first is a classical search and depth first is a classical search. And those are the two terms I would Google if, if I was you guys. That's the A star search. So what does this have to be with us, right? So why the heck do we care about Stanley, you know, as, as deep as his problems might be? And so the reason that you care about Stanley is that this is our parking lot example. And so when we started, we had three sections. We had the east section, the center section, and the west section. 
And we have three choices in which section to build, right? If we build the east section, then we have these solutions that come afterwards, right? The thing that happens when you draw those arrows, the thing that happens when you draw those presence arrows is this. You basically block every other option out of consideration. And so for this kind of tree, you probably have something in the order of maybe, you know, I don't know, few hundred million solutions, you've literally locked all of them except for one, which really doesn't seem like a good idea, right? And so what you start seeing is that if you want to have computers solve this problem, you need a way by which you can kind of dynamically generate schedule, which means dynamically change the path that you took through that search tree. Also what you'll need is if something changes, you want to the ability to kind of move to a different solution, i.e. a different path through the tree, because something changed. And that starts to kind of point you in the direction of where, where, where we're headed, right? So once again, to sort of, well, let me summarize kind of when I'm done with this. So this is, you know, the, the simplest, stupidest kind of example that we could find that, that shows us theoretically. You have two networks. A, D, E, H, uh, four tasks in each, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right? They take one day, two days, one day, one day, two days, four days, two days, two days, right? This is your network diagram. So we solved this using CPM, early start, early finish, late start, late finish, float, right? Duration, total float. Do a forward pass, a backward pass. You guys can Google that or I'm sure you've, you've covered it. And this is, this is the solution you get. You can see that the earliest completion time is, is eight days. So the duration of the task, the, the duration of the project is eight days. Well, let's kind of add resources to this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna add spatial requirements, right? So what you'll see here is I have C1, A1, right? Uh, and they occur in these areas. So C1 occurs here, A1 occurs here, B here, D here. EGFX, right? Long story short, C and A can't occur in the same space at the same time as you can see, right? And so what we'll need to do is we need to choose. We need to pick either A first or C first. If I pick A first, right, then I'll do C next, right? Which means I can do B and C at the same time. B takes two days and then I can do D here. Right, D has to wait for C to finish, right? So notice that my AD network took three days, right? Let's say I take C first. If I take C first, right? Then I can do A, right? Now I can do D, right? D had to wait for A to finish. And then I can do B. B takes two days. So you'll notice that my C first sequence took four days for the AD network. So I'm only focused on the left side on the on this <laughs> AD network. If I did A first, I need three days. If I did C first, I need four days. That same trick is repeated again for the EH network. Uh, it's the same network, it's the same trick played twice. And so long story short, if I do A first, E first, it's gonna take me nine days. If I do C first, E first, it takes nine days. A first, G first, takes 11. And C first, G first, it takes 12, right? Now, compare that to the original CPM solution, which was eight, right? And the reason that you're getting eight is that what CPM is does is that. It schedules them in the same place at the same time. So they clash, basically. So long story short, if I summarize the results, CPM gives you eight days, whereas the four sequencing options give you nine, 11, nine, and 12, right? And so um, long story short, um, with this really simple sort of um, problem, I guess, or, or network shows, it's only a task, but it shows two pretty cool things. One is that CPM assumed infinite resources, right? Uh, when we didn't model the resources explicitly. Two is that when you vary sequence, you vary networks. 
Now that becomes significant, right? Because there's lots of sequences, <coughs> sequences, right? And so to summarize, CPM assumes infinite resources if you don't use the precedence to resolve resources. So what I mean by that is that CPM assumes infinite resources if you don't draw those arrows, right? If you don't draw this thing, right? And if you draw this thing, then you've locked into one sequence. You can't explore any more sequences. So you've kind of got a choice, right? You either don't lock yourself in, in which case you're kind of not modeling resources. Now you're assuming infinite resources, right? And you're still locked into one sequence, right? Or alternatively, you say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to basically draw those arrows in, in which case I'm only going to look at one sequence, lock myself into a static non dynamic that cannot do anything useful by itself without me interfering and redrawing, you know, 200 arrows out of 6,000, right, in a typical state. And so back to this. So... So it's going to kind of change sequence, even if the presence is used to resolve resources, right? So even if you use those arrows to resolve resources, you're, you're sort of stuck in one sequence, right? <clears throat> and this actually took me some time to figure out, but the float on the critical path are sequence dependent, which is um, actually a bit of a problem because when you use those arrows to resolve, when you use presence to resolve resources, right? You kind of fix yourself in a certain sequence. But all your float calculations depend on how you drew those arrows. And so if any time in the future you want to resequence, which happens a lot, right? You know, there's a delay, it rain, whatever the heck it is, all your float numbers change, right? And uh, for those of you that really kind of want to delve into it, you're more than welcome to do the CPM calculations on the example that I sent you, and you'll kind of see that yourself. <coughs> So if you guys remember, we sort of briefly introduced this gentleman called John Fondal that in 1961 writes that CPM paper, right? He writes that non-computer approaches for using CPM in construction. So 30 years later, you know, kind of think about this for a second. This is kind of his entire career, 30 years, right? He accepts this Purifoy Award, which is sort of the Nobel Prize of construction, right? So for us construction geeks, that's kind of like a big deal, right? So he goes and he claims his prize, right? And he gets up there and he, and he gives a talk and it's called, you know, Development of the Construction Engineer, Past Progress and Future Problems, right? Kind of a good title, what you'd expect from a speech like that. And in that speech, he says, this brings up another related problem. Few of those who claim to be CPM experts fully appreciate the fact that in a resource restrained schedule, the concept of float breaks down, quite often the concept of critical path breaks down. Since almost all construction projects are resource restrained, at least to some extent, this becomes a source of major problems. Who owns the float time, right, um, is, is, is a, something that no one sort of has figured out. These are fundamental matters that after 30, well, at this point, 58 years still don't seem to be understood. It's kind of interesting, right? You, you've got the CPM guy, you know, the guy that really kind of brought CPM to the industry, right, standing up there and saying, hey, like, hello, there's, there's you know, trust me, there's something wrong with it. And so what I don't think he really sort of delved into is, is those simple examples that I've shown you, right? And, and again, I know that we're moving quickly. Um, I sort of figured that I'd give you guys a theory and then if you guys wanted to, you can kind of spend some time sort of digging through it. Um, this session is recorded, so it should be available afterwards. Um, Jen, if you're there, just confirming that, that it is being recorded. Oh, it is, yeah, I can see the sign. Okay. Yep, it is. Super, thank you. <laughs> so um, now we're going to move into sort of reality's actual complexity. We've looked at the practical kind of limitations of doing it by hand, and you guys have done this and seen that it's a you know pain in the neck, right? We moved into CPM limitations from a theoretical perspective, and kind of, I guess, from a theoretical perspective, you know, identified what the actual problem is, which is the fact that. It's a tool that forces you to use precedence constraints to resolve resource constraints. We've seen what the problems are when you do that, which is the fact that um, you lock yourself into a certain sequence, you cannot dynamically resequence or reschedule, right? Uh, and that you kind of knock out or ignore every other possible solution that there exists, right? 
Um, and so now let's take a look at what else you kind of need to model. And so this is the actual problem that was given to us uh, about four years ago at this point. So they had sort of nine zones, nine spaces. And the problem was when you wanted to move formwork, let's say from center ground floor <laughs> to center first floor, you had to kind of move that formwork through this location, up the ramp, through this location to this ramp. So you kind of had to move the formwork around. So you had to make sure that these areas were open. What you'll see here is, you know, this is what we use to kind of figure out, well, if I'm here, I need to kind of drive up the ramp and go to the next floor, right? Actually, the other way from here, I drive up the ramp to this floor, right? Or up the ramp. And so you can kind of see, you know, if I want to, W1 is, has to be, for me to move beams, W2 means that this area has to be clear, this area has to be clear, and these areas have to be clear, right? And you can kind of see how these spatial constraints are kind of being propagated through the system. Truthfully, if you were to try doing this by hand, I think it's almost impossible because, you know, what you're having to try to figure out is that, oh, wait, if I'm trying to move them here, no, then there's a block here. So I got to wait for that to finish. But then when this guy wants to move, this guy might be there. And oh, wait, no, I got to, it's almost kind of like, it, it's a really hard problem to solve basically. And so what we introduced, by the way, <coughs> over here, and sort of that, original problem, this thing, is only two constraints. Precedence, which is these arrows that are actually drawn here. And those arrows are real, right? And those arrows are, look, I cannot do the dex formwork until the beams form has been done, right? I cannot pour concrete until I have my formwork in there. So that, that's a precedence constraint. That's by definition how precedence works. And resources, uh, crew utilization. Those are the two constraints that we had in this problem. And you can kind of see how tedious manual it was to solve it with only two constraints. What I added was a third constraint, which was space. So spatial requirements, right? And that almost truthfully, you know, and we're not kind of getting into it. And um, we, we don't actually give this to the students. We, we, we found that to be a waste of time because it's just, it's, it's too complex, right? But, um, you know, those are three constraints and, and, and it starts to be at a point where it's pretty difficult for humans to solve. What does it take to solve actual construction projects? Well, the answer is available space we've looked at, crews we've looked at, precedents we've looked at, right? Now sequencing, which is dynamically reallocating resources, available <coughs> material, type of materials, consumer reusable, cranes and equipment, available cranes, location of cranes, movement of cranes, radio of cranes, construction method, so duration, production rate, prefabrication, on-site, et cetera. Design, lots of design options, changing design. Over time, everybody, you know, or we in the company really loved the calendars because they just complicate the heck out of everything, but calendar manipulations, 24 hour curing and so on and so forth. And finally, even if you get all of those right and you manage to kind of um, resolve all of these constraints, right? Delays. And once you have a delay, you've got to redo everything that comes before it, right? You've got to redo all of that. So that's basically what it takes to model construction, right? And what you're asking your typical sort of site engineer or your project manager, or your site, you know, superintendent, right? Is for her to do all of this in her head, right? Uh, I remember I, I was on a job in, uh, in Dubai, uh, junior sort of site engineer at the time. It was the Bentley Motors showroom, kind of a nifty project, but it was basically a parking lot. And they, they walked in and they asked me to kind of reschedule this whole project, you know, in, in one day. Different amounts of formwork, different crew types, different sequences, you know, and so on and so forth. And it was like, you know, the design had changed. And I kind of remember thinking like, this is kind of nuts. Like if I was to do this properly, you know, I, I need a lot more than a day, right? So that's kind of where, where you're at today. <clears throat> So now that we've kind of seen, you know, what is required, you know, what is, what is the, the capability of today's tools, where those theoretical issues lie and what they're actually supposed to be doing, right? Uh, let's start taking a look at the solution, right? And what it is that we need to start solving this, you know? And what I'm gonna show you, 
has taken me more than 10 years. I built it on top of four PhDs that came before me. And so it, I guess in some ways represents almost 28 or 29 years of research. Um, so it wasn't done, you know, overnight. It's, it's definitely taken a couple of weekends. Um, <laughs> what I'm going to show you, what I'm going to show you is, is about as compressed a, a, a presentation that I can on, on, on what it's doing. The key thing that you guys should watch for is that what we've done is we split planning from scheduling. And that's the trick, right? And you'll, you'll see that in, in, in a few minutes. So, so to solve this problem, we're going to need a few things. Uh, we're going to need a construction conceptual process model, right? Bit of a mouthful, but we'll get there. Uh, we need to separate planning from scheduling, right? We need to develop a planner from scratch since they don't exist. We need to develop an algorithmic scheduler, so scheduling with an algorithm. And then we need to parameterize a construction conceptual process model, right? Each of these tasks is probably, you know, a year and a half to two and a half years, by the way. We're going to cover it in 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, jumping into it. So you guys might know this. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. Anybody that does a little bit of Lord of the Rings might know this. And so the ring that we're looking for is the construction conceptual process model, conceptual model. So with that, you know, what the heck is a conceptual model, right? So does, that, does anybody in class know, Daniel? Are there any volunteers that would uh, like to share what a conceptual model is? Maybe. Maybe. Anybody want to take a guess? No volunteers. No volunteers. Okay. A conceptual model is basically uh, um, uh, semantic model of what it is that you're trying to think of. And so basically inside a conceptual model, you'll have a crew and a crew will have something like a production rig. You'll have tasks, activities, elements, components, uh, cranes, you know, equipment and so on and so forth. What are the sort of conceptual building blocks of what you're trying to you know, think about? And that's basically what, what, we, what you need to solve any problem. <laughs> what's surprising, at least to me, what's, and, it, and it's still surprising, is that there isn't one that's readily available, which is kind of nuts, right? Like, you know, $8 trillion a year industry, 10% of world GDP, but there's no conceptual model I have found to solve this problem. Um, you have conceptual models in design, IFC, that's a conceptual model, right? Uh, RATA, so on and so forth. I, I found many, many conceptual models in design. I have not been able to find one sort of targeted towards construction. Uh, what you're going to see now is, is sort of one that, that, that I've come up with that is importantly operationalized and so it works. Um, so let's start with some of the building blocks, key things. One of the things that is really, really important is the level of detail definition, LOD. And so, again, I have not found a, a, an LOD definition that, that I was satisfied with. Uh, to me, the key thing that an LOD definition needs to do is that if I, <coughs> excuse me, if I pick up a phone and call a, a project manager in Tokyo and I say, hey, uh, I'm working with this LOD, the project manager in Tokyo knows exactly what information is contained in my tasks in my schedule, right? And so the LOD definition I'm going to give you guys, uh, let's kind of skip through this. First of all, we're going to start with the organization breakdown structure, OBS. So general contractor manages subcontractors, subcontractors manage crews, and crews manage labor. Let's take a look at the PBS. So a project is made of systems, systems are made of elements, elements are made of components, right? And so that's basically what we're gonna focus on today, right? Um, this is just the WBS structure, which is kind of what ties these together. Uh, let's skip it for a time being, it'll become kind of clear what that is in a second. So notice a couple of interesting things, right? The general contractor, they're generally responsible for the project, right? The subcontractor 
the general responsible for systems, right? So the concrete subcontractor is responsible for this, you know, structural skeleton. Crews are generally responsible for components. So a column is made of concrete, it's made of, you know, steel, it's made of formwork and so on and so forth. Crews work in components. One of the first things you'll notice is that the fundamental unit of architecture, the element, right, does not have a fundamental unit in the organizational breakdown structure. Crews are responsible for concrete on, an, on, a, on a column, but nobody's really responsible for the column itself. That's kind of interesting, right? Because the fundamental unit of architecture is an element. And the fundamental unit of, a, of construction is really a crew. If you look at all sort of construction <laughs> data, the production, you know, the production rates, right? Or the durations or the tasks or, is all sort of standardized per crew, right? And so what that tells you is that if you're gonna use what the architects produce as input, which is really elements, BIM models, right? There must be this level of detail transform. You need to convert your elements into components and then attach them to crews, right? You'll kind of see that, you know, throughout the Alice solution, right? Um, so there must be an LOD transform to turn elements into components, right? If I want to use the, the BIM as input, I need to convert those elements to components and then attach crews to those components, right? Um, and that's kind of how Alice works. Now, at this point in time, we've, we've kind of looked at moving up and down, sort of, you know, up and down on this page, which is the abstraction level of detail. And we've looked at moving left and right, which is the organization breakdown structure, or the breakdown structure, whether the OBS or the PBS, organization or product, right? So we can move up and down, left and right. However, um, what I'm going to show you guys is that definition is insufficient. This took me, you know, about eight months to sort of work, work around. But the reason it's insufficient is this simple example here. So an operation is one crew working on the components within one element, right? The reason it's insufficient is here. Let's take this task, which is install rebar for a column, right? So if you take a look here, you know, a uh, steel crew working on rebar, steel crew working on steel inside the column, right, is my task. Once again, steel crew working on steel inside the column. That's how I'm going to define my task. So steel crew working on steel inside one column at a time is the left screen. Steel crew working on steel inside six columns on the right side. So notice that on the left side, I need six tasks. Each take a day. On the right side, I need one task. It takes six days, right? Now just focus on the blue, blue squares, right? Forget the yellow for the time being. The increase resources to two crews for blue columns, right? So we increase the resources to two crews for the blue columns, increase it to two crews for the blue columns. What happens on the left side? Well, on the left side, if I add a crew, this happens. On the right side, if I add a crew, that happens. On the left side, I change sequence. On the right side, I change duration. As you can imagine, if you're trying to develop an automated or algorithmic scheduler, it's usually a good idea to know if you need to change sequence or change duration. And so the missing piece of the puzzle is scope, which is kind of, you can think of it as coming out of the screen towards your face, so to speak. And so the crew, one crew acting in components in one element is an operation, right? And if you move sort of out of the screen towards you, crews acting on the components in several elements is an activity. And then one more level towards you, crews acting components for the whole project is sort of another task level. And so now you should have hopefully in your head, a sort of 3D matrix, right? That looks like, you know, this screen, just sort of three layers of that kind of coming out of the screen at you, right? And so the you can now move up and down, which is the abstraction level of detail. You can move left to right, which is the breakdown structures. 
right? And you can move in and out of the screen, which is the scope, which is how much, you know, or the quantity that your that your processes are acting upon, right? And so that's um, that's the level of detail definition. The fundamental currency of the Alice system is the one crew working on the components in one element, right? Or one group, as you guys will say. So that's basically what you need to kind of define LOD. This is why it's important. You want to know if you want to change sequence or duration, right? Without the LOD definition, by the way, solving this problem is like, you know, being in a car that's stuck in mud. You know, no, no matter what you think of, it, it starts to fail under certain conditions. And you, and you, you kind of can't figure out why it keeps failing until you, you sort of like peg that LOD definition. Once you've got the LOD definition, then you start to make progress because your, your solutions aren't failing for no reason anymore, or you know why they're failing. And so we've looked at the level of detail definition. We've defined a task, right? We define a task as the one crew acting on the components in one element or a group of elements, right? <clears throat> so then now that we've defined processes or what is a process within our world, right? And again, notice that, you know, that is part of the conceptual cons construction process model, right? It's part of how we think about what we're sort of trying to solve. The next thing that we're going to look at is constraints, right? And so a constraint is a mechanism which prevents an operation being scheduled at a given time, right? And notice that that's kind of the, the other way or the inverse way of doing this, right? Which is, as humans, we tend to think of what do I need to do next? What you have to tell the computer is what can you not do next? That's kind of a, a weird way to think about it, but it makes sense in, in the sense that if I tell the computer what to do next, I kind of have to tell it what else it can do next. Whereas if I tell it the computer what it cannot do next, I can then ask it, well, if you can't do, you know, four, five, six, why don't you try everything else, which is one, two, three, for example. If that makes sense. It, it kind of flips the problem around, but then it gives the computer the freedom to explore what it can do. So, Strangely, uh, out of seven years of PhD research, I have found one paper on sequencing. Um, it's worth just kind of taking a look at it. I can send that to you guys. Oops. Let's see if I can dig that up. There we go. So this is Sequencing Knowledge for Construction Scheduling. Notice the title is kind of interesting, right? What he's telling you is I want to change sequence with what I'm going to give you in this paper which is really what those constraints allow you to do. What you'll see here is that it goes through this. These are sort of the main sort of uh, thing, main categories, but then supported by, covered by, embedded in computing structural function, embedded in non-computing structural function, relative distance, distance to access, whether protected by trade interactions, space requirements are in there somewhere, unsafe uh, environment, space competition, and so on and so forth, right? Resource limitations, unsafe, damaging, requiring service, path interference, code regulations, right? So he sort of lays out that these are the 16 types of construction constraints, right? Um, and then he basically goes into talking about what's inflexible, flexible. In, in the literature, you'll, you'll hear a lot about soft and hard constraints. Um, I, I don't personally subscribe to that categorization. That's basically, you know, what those constraints are. We'll jump into now. Um, okay. We'll do sort of one more slide and then give you guys a, a quick break. This will be a good place to stop. So what I did in the, in the PhD was really take that list of construction constraints, those 16 construction constraints and convert them into generalized scheduling constraints. And what you'll notice in sort of uh, Eshigari's definition is it's not very clean, right? I mean, you know, notice that embedded in contributing to structural function, 
right, embedded in non-contributing the structural function, relative distance to support with flexibility of installation. It's, it's not a very clean definition and, and hopefully this will make more sense when I show you what the solution is. The, the reason that you want, and, and this is kind of a key point, the reason that you want to convert complex construction constraints into general scheduling constraints, right, is that if you don't do that, you then need, in this case, 16 buttons, right? And so you'll need a button for, well, it rained on Thursday. You'll need a button for, you know, the relative distance support with flexible installation. You'll need a button, button for that and so on and so forth. Whereas if you boil these down to sort of the, the, the fundamental, the core constraints, right, um, you basically need three buttons. And that's why you'll notice that Alice has basically three three sort of constraints or three sort of rules. The three constraints that I've managed to boil it down to are these. So a constraint is a mechanism which prevents an operation being scheduled at a given time, right? Um, you have two fundamental types of constraints. You've got precedence constraints and you have resource constraints. Precedence constraints can be represented using a network diagram. And that's a diagram you know, of, of tasks. Um, it is current state independent. Resource constraints cannot be represented using a network diagram, right? Because by definition, you know, there's a, there's a mechanism. The resource constraint needs to, to, if I was the resource constraint, right, I would have to look on site and say, hey, you're doing 10 resource tasks at the same time, um, uh, but I only have, you know, nine crews available, right? So I can't do that. I got to, look at what's happening on site and look at my um, resource pool, so to speak. There's, there's, this, there's this check, there's a mechanism, right? I'll t at the same time, I need to take resources out of my resource pool and assign them to task. Again, there's this kind of mechanism, which is not something you see with precedence. There, there is no real mechanism. You know, you can draw the network diagram. It doesn't, there's no, nothing really happening. If I need to complete A to do B, that's, true at all, if I complete A, I can do B at all points in the future. Whereas if I can perform a, a carpenter task today because I have carpenter crews, that doesn't mean I'll have carpenters tomorrow, right? That it's true for all times in the future, works with precedence, that's why you can use a network diagram, it's not true for resources. And so um, also maybe an important point, when I first kind of started to un uncover this, I, I went to the you know, industrial engineering department. And I talked to a PhD student there and I started showing him CPM and about 20 minutes into the conversation, he said, you know, why the hell would you use, you know, precedence to resolve resources? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. You know, and he said a bunch of four letter words and he stormed out the room, you know. And I sort of thought about that. I was like, wow, like that reaction was so visceral, right? It seems like nobody else in the world does it that way. And it doesn't seem like it's a good idea. But anyways, Precedence, resources, two main constraints. In resources, there's two subtypes. Discrete resources, where your capacity can be greater or equal to one. I have one crew, two crews, three crews, four crews, discrete numbers. And then unary resources, where the capacity is exactly equal to one. Right, and those are modeled with what we call disjunctive constraints. Right? Space is a, is a disjunctive resource. Uh, that's why if you notice in that example that I showed you guys, uh, Back then, that sort of simple uh, network thing here, I use space. <clears throat> you can't argue that I can just increase the number of space available, right? If I had used crews, somebody would have said, well, I'll just add another crew, right? Space is disjunctive. There's only one space available. So hopefully, you know, the building blocks, just to summarize, we've looked at the definition of what makes a task a task. And operation is a fundamental currency of our system. An operation is one crew working on the components of an element or a group of elements. That's an operation. We've then looked at constraints. Strangely showing you the only paper I found on construction constraints and formalizing them. And then showed you how you convert those construction constraints into generalized scheduling constraints, which are precedence and resources, two very different things that should not be confused or combined, you know, and resources are subdivided into discrete and unitary resources. So that's basically what I've got. Uh, I think it's a good time to take a break.
If you are okay with it, guys, I would recommend coming back in 10 minutes. Uh, but it's up to you, Daniel, how you want to do it. Yeah, let's do this. Um, let's take a 10-minute break. And um, then maybe if we have five minutes for just questions at this point, we could start the next session with any questions and then um, uh, continue on with the, the Alice intro. Yeah. Also, I'll, I'll be here if you guys want to ask any questions. So you want to, you know. <laughs> if you want to go up and have a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, Renee has made himself available. So good. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back at uh, 45 and uh, we'll continue on the lecture. So uh, in other words, the goal is now you can kind of take a look and start playing around with Alice. And then next week class, uh, we can answer questions and we can show you some of the more detailed information. But you have the information now to get started. Um, with that, I don't know if there was any general questions. I think we had some specific questions during the break, but did anybody have any general questions for Renee on the presentation so far? Okay. Uh, so with that, then, uh, Renee, I'll turn it back over to you. And uh, as I understand, he's going to just give an overview. You won't need to be logged into Alice right now at this point. Um, he'll just be showing some demos uh, using his own screen. So. Super. Thanks, Claude Daniel. Okay, so um, just a quick summary. We looked at how to define a process, a task, uh, the cruise acting component and an element or group of elements. We looked at constraints. Precedence, resources are the two main ones. Uh, resources are subdivided into discrete, so capacity can be greater or equal to one or unary, capacity equal to one. And so now let's take a look at that sort of key thing, which is splitting planning from scheduling. And so the way construction works today, you start with a design, right? And that design needs to get converted into a schedule, right? And we need to figure out who does what, when, and where to build the design. So that, that's basically what construction folks do. Um, to do that, we are going to do this in two steps, right? We're first going to con convert the design into a to-do list, a list of all the tasks you have to do. Right. And then we're going to schedule that list of tasks. Converting the, the design to do list is planning. Assigning start times to those tasks is called scheduling. So formal definition. So planning is converting the scope, your 3D, into a list of operations. Operations we've already defined. Their durations, precedence relationships, and resource requirements, both space and discrete. So equipment, material, and labor uh, is your resource requirements. Uh, scheduling is taking a list of operations of present relationships, durations, and resource requirements, based on this thing, right? Assigning start and end dates to each operation, such that no constraints are violated, and we want to improve construction metrics, such as cost and duration. Right? So those are sort of the two halves of the puzzle. Um, the question is, how do we set up the planning so that, you know, in, we can capture and encapsulate the rules of the construction projects, right? And so this is an overview. I'm going to show the slide, you know, at least one more time. But what we've done is we split planning from scheduling. Planning is the rules that govern your construction project. Scheduling is assigning start times to those or, or, or creating schedules that satisfy those rules. You collect information, you create that rule set. So which tasks, which resources, et cetera. You send it to the scheduler. And then the scheduler generates lots and lots of options that satisfy that rule set. Automatically calculates cost, duration, and 4D for you. You then interpret the results, right? Um, let's see here. Um, the reason that you do it this way is that you can then change anything in the rule set. You can add a crane, remove a crane, so you can change that, press the button and rebuild it. And that's kind of the, the power of the system that we built. You can, for the first time, build and rebuild your project over and over again, right? So how does it work? Um, this is sort of a, a simple overview. So planning, so there's, there's kind of three rules. Right, there's three ways to convert complex construction constraints into general scheduling constraints. Right? Or three rules, I should say. You can even uh, change that right here. Right. Right. 
And so um, the way it works is that let's assume that you want to build something simple. So a column slab, column slab, right? That's your project. That's your scope. The first thing you want to do is you want to group and split. We're not showing that, but you know, you can think that you want to maybe group all of the columns on one floor into one group, right? You have a supported by uh, constraint. So which element supports which? So the column supports the slab, the slab supports the column, the column supports the slab, right? <coughs> and your recipes. And the recipe is basically how, you know, what do you need to build a given element, right? And so for us, the recipe is going to contain the operations, right? The durations within recipe logic and resources. This is our recipe. And so uh, task one needs crew, crew type A, task two needs crew type B, and so on and so forth, task three, task four, task five. And that gets replicated to uh, the next column. So you create that recipe once, and you copy it to the next column. You create the recipe for the slab, and I guess copy it to the next slab, right? Um, now, the thing is that at this point, you have a, a bunch of these recipes that have been created and you know assigned to the next column. Maybe for this to be a little bit less abstract, let me just maybe briefly jump out of this, show you guys what the actual recipe looks like. And so if I was to click on the slab, formwork, put the steel, pour the concrete, cure the concrete, remove the formwork, five tasks. And those tasks have some resources, labor, equipment, material space, right? So this is basically the, um, these are the rules. This is the, the recipe, right? Now the, the thing is that what we've done is we've set this up where we've created these recipes and then we've copied those recipes onto other elements. The problem is if you press schedule at this point, what the software will try to do is it will schedule this task, T1 crew A, this task, T1 crew A, this task, T5 crew F, this task, T5 crew F, all at the same time. Because these recipes are kind of not connected to each other. So does anybody know how you connect these recipes together to create that network diagram that you need. Some of you might have noticed, some of you maybe not, we'll see, but the, the way to do it is this next element and previous element. So that supported by constraint is actually used to connect your recipes together, right? And so it seems simple, but what's actually happening is that um, external references are, are ties between recipes. So you could, for example, I want to connect C to, you know, T3 to T7 for some reason. So I could do that if I wanted to. But long story short, that is the network diagram of the elements in your model. Uh, so anybody like to guess at which of these are the columns and which are the slabs? <laughs> Actually, pretty simple. <laughs> Do we have any any volunteers, Daniel? Any brave volunteers? Which are the columns? Which are the slabs? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, John. The junctions are the slabs because they support all the columns. So where all the columns go into one, and then they spread out again. Those are the slabs. Did you hear that, Renee? I heard the uh, yeah. If you could repeat it, maybe I heard a little yeah. bit. Where the all the other ones join together into one element are the slabs. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's the uh, that's a slab. And you know, one thing compared connected to a lot of things, connected to one thing, connected to a lot of things, right? So these ones are your slabs, these ones are your columns. And when you create those recipes, what effectively happens is that. That's your um, slab, right? Over here. Connected to columns, right? That's a slab as well. And so basically what, what you do is you create this one, one task, right? Or one recipe, sorry. And that gets replicated out and, and you suddenly have this 4,000 
activity network diagram automatically created for you. Just, I, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so moving on, uh, this is actually what you end up with at the end of that planning process. And so uh, this was actually what we were doing in 2011. So you've got your, your, your list of tasks, your code, your description, uh, the hours, the duration, your predecessors, your resource labor, and your resource space, right? You notice you got to model space, we've got the lower left X, Y, and the upper right X, Y. Right. Um, uh, as you can imagine, this was uh, uh, a lot of fun. You have to create, you know, a long list of tasks of like, you know, 500 of these. And then the thing that would, that would kill you was when you had a, a cyclical relationship. So one of these predecessors is somehow pointing at something that points at itself. So finding that, I mean, you know, was, was like a three day endeavor. You kind of lose your mind doing it. But um, yeah, so that's basically what the, the output of the, the, the planning stage is, is that, that what I used to call the input file. Notice something kind of interesting here is that you've got a column for uh, the task. You got a column for duration, a column for the precedence constraint, a column for the labor constraint, and a column basically for the uh, space constraint. And that's sort of what I started to realize was that that pattern, those three constraints were in there over and over again. They're in the planning and the scheduling and so on and so forth. And that's, that's why the system is parametric because these, these constraints basically like no matter where you look in the system, you can, if you look carefully, you'll start seeing those constraints in there. And that's why if you change it in one area of a system, it ripples through the other areas of the system. And so that's basically it on the planning. And so, um, uh, this is, you know, I got asked a question in the, in the break, and this is kind of, I quickly put this together to answer that question, but you know, what's really happening here is that, you know, why isn't it, one of the reasons it hasn't been done before is if you wanted to create these, um, if you wanted to create these tasks, you know, imagine having to go through like a thousand of these tasks manually. Right? Uh, like I said, you, 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 you tend to lose your sanity, right? Um, what's happening with, with Alice is that, you don't, you, you've got this coarse level of detail, fine level of detail, right? What I can tell you is you can schedule 90% of construction projects in the world with about 500 to 6,000 tasks. Now creating 500 tasks like this is really tedious, error prone, and so on and so forth, right? The trick is that you create these recipes. Alice automatically replicates those recipes, increasing the level of detail runs this simulation, which basically means resolves all those constraints for you, and then aggregates it back up into something you can read using summary tasks and this 4D, right? So that's kind of the, the, the trick, so to speak, is that you don't, as a human, tend to spend too much time here. You spend your time up here, right? So that's kind of how it's done. Um, this is the conceptual model. Uh, that we've that we've developed for planning and you can see that the element you know the the recipe is what connects the elements to your components and your crews and the crew working with components in one element becomes an operation and your list of operations is your to-do list right and that's basically the conceptual model for how it works you can kind of see these little notes I was making and how the data transfers happen and which steps happen before which ones and so on and so forth um, so that's planning. Moving to scheduling. Um, what we need is an algorithmic solution. So this is the, this is a simple scheduler that was developed uh, by a gentleman called Wach, uh, did his PhD also at Stanford. Uh, you start with a product model. What, what do I want to build? Your product model basically gets converted into a list of tasks, the to-do list, right? And so notice that we're kind of skipping the planning piece, right? We're saying, hey, we took a 3D model and now we have this. This is a to-do list, right? Um, that whole planning piece, you know, this whole thing here, just sort of saying, let's assume that's done, right? Which is what you need to assume because now we're in the scheduling piece. This has all been done. We ended up with an input file. That input file is this to-do this to -do list. 
Well, okay, now we need to schedule it. So what do we do? Well, if you remember, constraints, a constraint is a mechanism which tells you when a given process cannot be scheduled. And so I look at my precedent constraints and what's going to happen is I have a to-do list, a can-do list, a doing list, and a done list. And my, my tasks kind of move from one to the next sequentially. So the first thing I do is I, I cut out, I knock out all the tasks that can't be done because the precedent hasn't been completed. I can't build the roof because the 10th floor hasn't been done. I can't build the 10th floor because the 9th floor hasn't been done and so on and so forth. So I remove all the tasks that I can't do because their precedent has not been completed. So I end up with this list, one, two, five, six. Now, process six happens to happen in the same space as this yellow box here. So I cannot do process six at this point in time. So I need to remove six. So I have my can do that satisfies precedence and space. Process five requires carpenters and I have no carpenters available. So I need to remove that. And now I have my can do that satisfies precedent space and uh, uh, discrete resources, right? And so now I have my actual can do, right? So I can actually schedule process one or process two. What I'm going to do is I'm going to schedule process one and I'm going to assign a task as a resource to it from my resource pool, right? In the next run, so when I kind of rerun this, when I kind of reset, rerun it, what I'm going to do next time when I reach this point is I'm going to basically switch that and schedule process two instead. So the sort of, this again is, is part of the conceptual construction process model, right? How is it working at a conceptual level? What are the building blocks and the mechanisms that, that are, you know, moving around or being moved around in my system. What you're seeing here is that um, you're taking a list of tasks, applying uh, constraints to them to resolve, uh, uh, resolve, resolve these constraints, right? You're resolving these constraints and you're step-by-step -step basically creating an actual list of tasks that you can do. And the final thing that I've shown here is how do you then change sequence, right? Schedule process one, right? Schedule process two, right? What, what's interesting here is that effectively what we're doing is we're, we're selecting a different path to go down that, that search tree. I go back to was over here, right? What we're doing is we're basically saying, hey, um, we're selecting different ways to get through that search tree. And so in one case, we're doing scheduled task one and the next one we're doing task two and so on and so forth. Right? We, can, we know that, that resequencing is important because we've shown that it affects metrics, right? So this, for example, here, different sequences have different metrics, different durations. So you basically go through this, create the to-do using your plan Right, your planner is what converts the product model into do list. Precedence constraints to give you a can do that that's all that that's valid for precedence, valid for precedence space, valid for precedence space, and discrete resources. Now you have the actual can do, schedule one process, assign a resource to it. Next time, flip that, schedule <coughs> process, assign a resource to it. So now you've seen how the, the scheduler kind of works. Um, uh, so this is basically what, uh, the tool looked like back in 2011. Notice that we're uploading the, the fuzzy scheduler, which means that it allows overlaps, uh, the men's fashion project constraints, not text. So that's my precedence, right? The men's fashion space requirements, right? The men's fashion's task name descriptions, right? Uh, the total area of the project is 186 square meters. Um, the maximum overlap around is 50%. I want to do a thousand sequences, right? And I forget what that one was for. Basically, you, you put that in there. Uh, and, you know, hopefully you've got some good beer because uh, you're going to be doing a lot of this. And so you're sitting there waiting for this thing. And it's running, right? It's doing a thousand simulations and you see somewhere around there. Oh, still waiting. There you go. 
And that's basically what you're seeing here, right? Is that uh, the top view of what's happening, what, what's happening, right? Where, at what time, right? And it's running lots and lots of kind of sequencing options there, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's basically the planning and the scheduling piece. Uh, this is the conceptual model for the scheduler. Uh, it ended up actually being a patent that we filed for. But you can see here your to-do list. That's the, the precedence check. That's the space check. And that's the resources check. So those three green um, squares are the three constraints that you need to resolve. And that red thing is what sort of resets it, shuffles the, the can-do, the to, to the to-do list and then allows you to restart it and explore different sequences. Right. So that's kind of the scheduling piece. So uh, we've looked at the CPM limitations from a practical perspective, seen what a pain it is to do this manually, looked at what's happening theoretically. Uh, we've looked at what actually needs to be solved, right? And how, you know, I, I believe it's impossible to do that with current tools. We've now given you guys the sort of key building blocks into the solution. And those key building blocks, by the way, just kind of summarize, we started with the level of detail definition. So what is makes a task a task? That's kind of important to know, right? Um, the crews acting as the components in one element, right? Or a group of elements is an operation, right? And so that's, you know, what forms the currency of your, your scheduler, right? We've looked at constraints, right, and what they are, mechanism of currency operation being scheduled given time. We've noticed that there's basically two main types of constraints, precedence resources. Resources are subdivided into discrete, which have a capacity greater or equal to one in integers. Unary, which is exactly equal to one. We've split planning from scheduling. We've shown you guys how the planner works and what you know is going on in the background from an element and then a task perspective, how the, this network diagram is automatically generated, which kind of forms the input, right? So this is basically what that input looks like. That network diagram is encoded in this row over here in the presence, right? That forms the input file for your scheduler. And then we've shown you how a simple scheduler works, right? And how it gets resolved. So now you have the sort of key conceptual building blocks. You have that conceptual process model of how to solve the problem. Let's start having some fun, right? And so the next thing we're gonna do, since we've now got the construction conceptual process model, let's start playing with it and see if we can parametrize it. So what is parametric technology, right? And so what we're gonna look at is parametric design. Let's say I want to draw a cylinder. I draw two ellipses, two lines, right? I want a smaller cylinder, I redraw. I want a bigger cylinder, I redraw, right? And so, um, you know, I've got to redraw the tool every time, right? If my tool is parametric, I've got a height and radius, I change the parameter and the tool redraws the object. That's parametric design. Uh, we don't redraw, we, we rebuild, we reschedule. And that's parametric construction. Um, Again, as I promised you guys, two slides on history. Uh, I always kind of try to know a little bit about it. Uh, you know, as a PhD student, you, know, you don't have much going for you, but you do have time to think and kind of explore things, which is the fun part. Um, 1974, a gentleman called Stan Geisberg, who is Leningrad. Uh, in 85, he founds a company called PTC, raised $4 million from Charles River Ventures. Uh, classic sort of Silicon Valley story. Uh, three years to sell their first product, right? Uh, they're, I think, 1.3 billion in revenue today. Yep. Uh, Geisberg Software bought an important innovation in the CAD CAM world that even his competitors conceded was revolutionary. Software could recognize a change in a single variable of design and adjust the rest of the model accordingly. For example, a person designing a plane exchange length of the wings, and Geisberg Software would in, in, show you what implications that change would have on the rest of the plane. Right. Uh, on the bottom half, this is parametric design for mechanical engineering. Uh, interestingly enough, the question that I was asked in the, in the break was, was the 
limitation for scheduling the processing power? Uh, my answer was no, I don't think so. But from a parametric design perspective, yes, it was. Uh, buildings are generally more complicated than engines or bigger. And so it was really hard to get it done in the architectural world, right? A bunch of folks tried. Then in 1997, two key developers, right, left a company called PTC and formed a company called Charles Liver Software. So you can take a wild guess at where they probably got their first money from, right? And they developed a software called Revit, right? And so um, they then sold it actually five years later and then went on to do something else. Right? And you guys probably know all of this, but you know, moving a wall inside Revit updates the neighboring walls, floors, roofs, and all that kind of stuff, right? It's a parametric tool, right? And so that's the history of parametric technology. Uh, what we've done for the first time is parametrized construction. That's kind of what we managed to do. So why is that important? Why the heck do we care? Well, the reason is, the reason that you want to parametrize it is that you want to be able to dynamically resolve those constraints, right? And so again, kind of hopping out here, but the parameters that you can change inside of Alice are actually that list that I showed you guys over here. This is why we, this, the title of the slide is usually parameters you could change inside Alice. So you can change any of these things parametrically and then rebuild it, uh, which is pretty powerful. So back to this, there's lots of ways to build something. For example, let's assume that you want to tile this building. So you could use three crews and they could kind of move in this U-turn shape, right? You could use six crews and they could kind of crisscross through your building. So two different ways. You could use three crews, U-shape, six, six crews cross sequence, right? So let's take a look at a simple project, right? And I think you guys are going to schedule something that looks very similar to this. Um, uh, you can build one zone in each floor, two zones, three zones, four zones, right? Sequencing options. So let's look at the four zone option. I got four choices for my first zone, three for my second, two, one, right? Let's only look at the carpenter, steel, concrete, and MEP inserts. One, 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 two, one, one, three, one, one, two, one, two, two, three, one, and so on and so forth. Right? Well. It's actually 33,000 ways to build a box, right? And that's not including calendar manipulations, overtime, one crane, two cranes, mobile cranes, radius of cranes, 24-hour curing, multiple shifts, design changes, and so on and so forth. There generally tends to be in the order of, you know, half a billion, half a trillion, and so on and so forth, a uh, number of solutions for a given problem, you know? And that's, by the way, why computers can't solve everything, right? It's just there's too many, there's too many options, right? So when you look at this, right, when you look at what we sort of laid out, um, you know, how do you kind of address that complexity today, right? You know, you've got 33,000 ways to build a box, right? What do you do today? How many options you look at? No. Nah. One. What do you get? You, you put, you know, uh, four days into it on the lower end, you put four weeks or four months on the upper end. If it's really complicated and big, what do you get? You get one single dot, one option, right? Somebody comes in and says, Hey, we're going to, it's going to cost 750 days and $51 million. Right. Okay. Great. What, what does that, what does that mean? Like, is, is that fast? Is it cheap? Like, you know, how, how does this option compare to all the other options, right? Because, I mean, if you, if you had 600 million schedules, which we actually did for this project, and the fastest schedule was 750 days, it's probably not a good idea to try to build in 750 days, right? And that's basically what you get today. If you're lucky, somebody creates another option, and that's basically it, right? One or two scheduling options for large, complex projects, right? Which, when you start thinking about it, right, like, you know, there's 33,000 ways to build a box and that's not even considering lots and lots of other variables. You're looking at one, right? That leaves a lot of value on the table, right? So, 
you know, how does Alice do it? Again, the slide kind of, and I always go back to it. We split planning from scheduling. The human kind of is the one that creates this rule set, sends it to the scheduler. The scheduler crunches all this constraint stuff for you, right? Which is truthfully a really boring thing to do. Like why anybody would want to spend their life crunching constraints is absolutely hard, you know? Um, and then you would interpret the results. Notice that the thing that you'll see in AI, and it's a pattern we see over and over again in Silicon Valley, you know, the human doesn't get eliminated. The human becomes the entity that sets it up, the blue arrows. The computer crunches it for you, and the human interprets the results, the, the blue arrows again, right? You can then tweak anything in the rule set and rebuild it. See the effect on your, your metrics, right? Types of parameters. So uh, people today in industry refer to parameters, and they kind of mean design parameters because, you know, it hasn't existed before. And so the only parameters we've had available are design parameters. And there's, there's kind of two ways to think about it, I think, you know, the design parameters within a Revit. So I can change the length with height and my column changes size, right? Uh, and then I can change the model. I can add a different model and then, you know, reschedule with an output, right? Uh, so if I, if I change the model, I completely change the, the elements that are inside of it. I add a floor, or I add a building or whatever it is, right? And so kind of two levels of detail there, you know, changing the parameters within an element and changing the whole model. Planning parameters, that's kind of like, well, that's kind of where we're starting to go into what has never been done before, right? Which is the ability to be able to change recipes, labor, materials, equipment, production rates, um, you know, resources and so on and so forth, calendars, grouping, splitting, supported by all of this stuff that's in the plan, right? And finally, you've even got scheduling parameters which is you can change sequence and even you can change duration analysis. So you can assign multiple crews to the same task or use production rates and it will change duration for you based on different sort of tasks. Um, these are sort of the, the three types of parameters that you need in your system. Uh, and what's kind of cool is that you can change any of these parameters and see that change kind of ripple through your entire kind of system, right? Um, what, one of the things that I kind of show in class is I go back to, and I'm not going to get into it, there's not enough time, but I go back to that conceptual model that I introduced here, this thing, and I show clearly, okay, so if I change the design, what happens? You know, if I change the production rate, what happens? If I change sequence, what happens? And you guys have seen that one, right? If I change production rate, if I change, you know, design, but, you know, so on and so forth, and I show how these parameter changes ripple through and, and how the data transfers happen, right? So that's kind of... Um... So to summarize, right, you know, what is Alice, right? Well, Alice is, we flip planning and scheduling, right? And so what do we do? Well, we change parameters, design parameters, planning parameters, scheduling parameters, and we automatically reschedule. Right? And the schedules all have metrics, right? So what is the fundamental question that we're trying to answer here, right, is this. You know, the value of the construction engineer is basically ascertaining what parametric values will result in which metric values, and thus, which parametric values are desired for the team. Do you want one crane, two cranes, overtime, etc.? And this is something that really stumps me about the industry, right? Which is in the pre-construction phase, we believe that the role of the pre-construction team is to really answer these questions, right? Is to say, look, we've looked at building it with two cranes and 10 steel, you know, crews, but I think it's three cranes and four, or whatever the numbers are, right? And so, you know, that's, we think the role of the construction engineer of the future. Um, also note that, um, you know, the human is not the one that does the number crunching, the human is the one that does the uh, interpreting of the results, right? And so current, you know, current costs of computing power are, you know, 1.3 cents. And so if you want to make your money doing the number crunching, I hope you guys are going to be satisfied with a salary of about a cent an hour, right? Um, what you can make a lot more money on is actually setting up what you can be crunched, right? Uh, Daniel, just a quick time check. Do we have... Uh, 10 minutes left or is it a little bit longer? Yeah, yeah we've got 10 minutes left. Perfect. Metrics, so we're almost kind of done. 
the metrics that we've got is, is duration, number of calendar days, cost. The way that we calculate costs is this one on the bottom. And so the blue is when the, I have, you know, three crews on the second day, two crews on the sixth day, one, one, one. And so what Alice does is fills out the rest of this because the assumption is that if I needed two crews, I would order two crews on the first day and keep them there to the last day. So that's how we calculate costs. Workflow. So this is something that uh, has fried a lot of brain circuits here. Uh, it really was a bane of my existence. This is what the original solutions would look like. And you can see they're not very, and they're kind of all over the place. The new version of Alice has actually started to address that. Uh, with something that looks like this, and you'll start seeing nice, smooth workflows that are in it. This is a prototype, so it's not on the solution that you guys will use, but this is kind of coming down the line. Uh, you'll sort of see this over here as well. <coughs> you'll kind of see that there's a nice kind of workflow to the work here. Other metrics, minimize time on site quality and safety, and that's basically it. That takes us to the demo, right? Um, one of the things that I started to explain is that, you know, when you look at solutions in our field, you know, there's too many shapes to draw on a computer. We invented AutoCAD. The computer can draw the cross sections automatically. We've got Revit. Structures are too complicated to be calculated. A computer, we invented SAP. Construction is too complicated to be done on a computer, Alice. In each of these solutions, the, hum the, the software gives the human a way to encode complex reality into the software. And so we set it up, you know, and, and that's kind of what happens in Alice as well. The human uses their intuition and experience to set up the rule set, send it to the schedule that does the crunching, the human interprets the results, right? Back to this thing. So that leaves us about eight minutes, which I think is about what we need. Uh, like I said, I skewed heavily on the theory. You guys will get to try all of this yourselves uh, in, the, in the next class. Yeah, you know? exactly. If, if we have the theoretical foundation, we understand what we're doing. So that's why we really want to cover the theory in detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, how it works, you upload a 3D model, what you want to build, three rules. First rule is physics. So my 242 elements are supported into 93 support groups. So the yellow is physically supported by the purple. Yellow is physically supported by the purple. Physics is an important part of construction, as you guys know. Rule number two is grouping and splitting. And so I want to build all my columns on this floor in one go. There's three slabs here, but somebody grouped them and unsurprisingly call this level eight slabs, right? Columns on top of it will probably be, be called level eight columns, right? So rule number one, physics. Rule number two, grouping, splitting. Uh, rule number three, recipes. You guys have already seen this. So a recipe is formwork, put the steel, pour the concrete, cure, remove formwork, right? Uh, I have some resources, labor, equipment, crane, material, and so on and so forth. Notice that a question, many questions that we get asked get answered with what I'm going to show you today. So the interiors are modeled as boxes, right? So if I want to do the interiors, I'll model these boxes and I attach the recipes to those boxes. Sprinkler, layout, ductwork, gas piping, and so on and so forth, right? And so that's basically the recipe for this. You guys are going to run a very simple project, by the way. Um, we have run it on just about anything you can think of. High rises, skyscrapers, shopping malls. Um, you know, you, we've done a reconstructions, uh, complex kind of reconstruction. Oh, disappeared. There we go. So you can see here that this is actually a facade for three buildings. Temporary, only, you know, there's a 200 temporary offices. We can move them into... Um, there's, uh, you know, sunlight constraints and all kinds of crazy stuff happening here, right? Uh, just kind of letting you know that you guys are definitely running the, the simpler, the really, really simple kind of example, right? But uh, those are the three rules. Uh, you have a resource pool. So appliance, I got two appliance crews available, 500 bucks an hour. Work weeks, you can see that concrete dries 24 seven. And that's basically what we've got here. Uh, and then the big deal is you can now start scheduling and rescheduling, right? And so, uh, let's see, that's the thing, right? Each of these dots is a different way to build your project. 900 days, 60 million, 834 days, 46 million, 800 days, 47 million, 
723, 49 months, so on and so forth, right? You can rebuild it over and over again. Um, these dots, as, as pretty as they are, and I'm, I'm sure you guys appreciate the, the abstract art, but uh, they wouldn't be very useful if you couldn't click on them, expand it, and you get the Gantt charts that you know and love, as well as an automatically generated 4D model on the right side. You can kind of see that, you know, this was entirely generated by the computer. The days of uh, copy pasting tasks and linking tasks to 3D and doing all this really fun, fun stuff are over. You can really focus on the, the value generation uh, aspect of construction. And you can kind of rebuild, reschedule. There's a analytics page. You can see that my average utilization is 68% for this solution. It's probably going to be 61% if I'm on the right tab on this solution. But you kind of see that the, the, the pattern over here is, is jaggedy because you, don't, you have too many carpenters that are working too quickly. They're clanging into the people in front of them. The people behind them are waiting. There's not the right ratio of crews. Whereas when you get the right ratio of crews, it looks like that. It's nice and smooth, right? So once again, jagged pattern. That. Right. Versus um, kind of a nice smooth one. Oops. There we go. I don't know if it's really visible, but if you look at the top, you can definitely see this kind of smooth-ish as compared to this guy where it's jaggedy. Right. And that's really sort of it, I guess. The, the last piece of the puzzle I want to show you guys um, you know, the, you start getting some real advantages, right? The way construction works today is you've got the scope, you create an estimate, and it's, you know, element-based. A thousand columns cost me a, mil uh, a million bucks. One column is a thousand, so 10 columns today is 10,000. I break into labor code material, create a master schedule, a three-week look-ahead that has to fit into the master schedule, a one-week look-ahead that has to fit into the three-week look-ahead. These things are separate today. So a question I often like to ask is, does how you build it affect how much it costs to build it? People think about it and they go, yeah, of course. If you change how you're building it, it change how much it costs to build it. So how on earth are you guys doing your estimate without your schedule? And people kind of smile. The reason is that to do an estimate from a schedule, you need a very detailed schedule. To create a very detailed schedule, like Alice can do in 10 minutes, would take you two years. So people don't do it. Whereas with Alice, the rule set, the recipe, converts your schedule, converts your scope into a schedule. It's, it's at a very fine level of detail. And you can use that to basically calculate costs. By definition, your scope, cost, schedule are integrated. They're basically the same thing, right? That's one advantage. The other advantage is your rule set is separate. Because it's separate, it becomes very, very quick and easy to understand what was the person thinking when they created my, my rule set. Here are my recipes. Here's my supported by, right? Here's my grouping. Within 15 minutes, you know, you know exactly how the person was thinking about it. Whereas with you know, existing technology, like look at a 3,000 activity network diagram and good luck trying to figure it out in less than two or three days, right? You can then generate lots and lots of options. All these are valid. You have 100% guarantee on your constraint resolution. You can't over allocate resources or schedule things out of precedence. You can generate lots and lots of options and you can minimize. On average, we save about 17% on duration, about 13% on equipment and labor costs. So that's... That's basically it. Great. Leaving you about uh, 60 seconds to spare. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any quick questions. One quick one, yeah. Uh, what are the limitations of this? Because, um, as you described it, now you could even plan like a good chair for it. Or, or what, what are you working now on to solve? Then you can trade all the problems still have to solve. Were you able to hear that, uh, Renee? Yep. Oh, no, I didn't hear the, the, the question. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, the question was, what, uh, what are the constraints? What are you working to solve now um, that, you, that Alice can't do yet? Huh. Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, I mean, it, it, it was a really weird feeling for me. It was like, you know, mountaineering. So it was like, I spent eight years of my life solving the next thing, solving the next thing, solving the next thing. So like, 
you know, we had the scheduler and then we got it to work. And then, then the start to start relationships, we got that to work. And we got the planner to work and the recipes and the external references and the cranes and the crane radio and the calendar. And it was just like the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it was just like one day, it was like, wait, there's, there's nothing else. Like, <laughs> it's like, I, I think, I think, I think it's done. And so it's been, a, it's been a year, it's been a, over a year at this point. We, I no longer spend any time on the, on the, on the constraints and the core algorithm. We have not had a single project where we've not been able to model what they've asked us to model. Uh, we've done high rises, shopping malls, uh, airports, bridges, whatever, parking lots, offices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like there is no, constraint we have not been able to model. Uh, our current sort of focus is on the UI, the UX, um, you know, uh, focusing on, on the reporting, ability, security, things like that's what I spend my days on. Uh, the core algorithm, that, that part is done, you know, yeah, for sure. But great question. Great. Yeah, it's a good question. I'd say that the other, the other challenge for you now is scaling the business so that uh, more people can, uh, can have the choice to use it. Uh, we'll close oh, yeah. it there. And, and I would like to say a big thank you, Renee, for the for the lecture. And uh, we'd like to just give you a round of applause. So thanks. So thanks, Renee. Thank you, Renee. Bye bye. Have a good day. And I have a small gift for you when I see you in January at Stanford. So uh, that will come your way for, for thanks. But uh, 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 otherwise, we'll sign off there. And um, class next week, we'll get into the assignment in more detail. Uh, and, uh, uh, don't miss that if you are planning on doing production time number four. So. <laughs> <laughs>